England have had a bit of a tortuous week, both on and off the pitch. There was obviously the defeat in the second test at Chennai. Um, but what followed then has been a bit unfortunate in terms of the Moeen Ali situation. Uh, we're very pleased to say that we are joined by George DeBell from ESPN Creek Info, uh, who's written an excellent piece on this this week. So, George, um, welcome to the show. Could you just run us through what has happened and after that, your thoughts on the situation? Good day. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, the, with the Moen situation, he, he obviously was recalled to the England squad, having not played since the first test of the Ashes in 2019. Test cricket, anyway. And uh, that, that, was, that was good as far as it went, except that he caught COVID. Uh, and so he spent every bit of two weeks in isolation at the start of the tour, so missed the Sri Lankan games. Uh, and as was always the policy ahead of the tour, all England's all-format players were to get a break out of the bio-bubble at some stage. And I know some people won't necessarily understand what that's like, and I get that, uh, but touring is brilliant. I mean, there's, it's, it's, it's lovely, but it's also extremely hard uh, because you are away from your families for a long time. And in recent years, the uh, most international teams have been really sensible about this. They've managed their um, that relationship between the, uh, as employers and sort of benevolent uh, employers quite well. And families have been able to join teams on tour a lot. Obviously, in the time of COVID, that's not a goer. So for someone like Moen, he would have been away for something like three months straight without any um, access to see this. His, 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 he's got two young kids uh, to see his family. Uh, I mean, they all are. They're all in the same boat. And it's very difficult. So, uh, and then if you throw in the IPL as well, it could potentially be five months. And he's just been picked up in the IPL auction today. So that was the possibility. So England had promised everybody a bit of a break at some stage. And you'll remember that Jofra and Ben Stokes didn't go to Sri Lanka. And you'll remember that uh, Joss Butler played the first test. Everyone will know that, you know, various players have already had rests and come and gone. And that seems like a good, healthy thing to me. The problem was with Moen that he only was fit enough, really, to return to the, to the, to the series for this game in Chennai. Um, he, he was a, a wee bit rusty, but I thought he showed some, some good sides. I mean, he ended up with eight wickets, for goodness sake, and, but for drop chances, he would have had 10 at least. So that's a pretty decent return. Uh, but people seem to have forgotten, even though it was a matter of public record, that he was due to go home after the second test. So, uh, and also with England having gotten themselves in a bit of a mess by dropping Don Bess, potentially shattering his confidence a wee bit, and then being reliant probably on Don Bess with Moen going home, it was all a bit uncomfortable. So they, at the last minute, on the third day, I think, of this last game in Chennai, asked Moen to stay on. And at that stage, you know, Moen's in an impossible situation. I mean, I know that his son, who's seven, is phoning every day and going, oh, only four days now, and that sort of thing. And he's been doing that for a while. His family have been watching on while he's got COVID. And, you know, uh, he's in a very difficult position. Uh, on one level, I, um, you know, I very much wanted him to stay in many ways. Uh, um, he, he said he had to go because your first responsibility is to your family. It's, it's, it's got to be that way. Um, so he went home and it was probably unfair to ask him. Now, then Joe Root, uh, clarifying that Moen was going, said in the post-match press conference, uh, Moen has chosen to go home. Now, I think that is just a slip of the tongue. I really do. And I think if, if, if people like me keep putting microphones in front of people like him in times when they're exhausted and all the rest of it, eventually they're going to say something wrong. I mean, it, it, it's that, that's fine. But the, the issue with that was that it, it, it set a narrative rolling and there were people who interpreted it as Moeen showing some sort of lack of dedication, commitment, and maybe being a bit flaky and stuff. Uh, and, and those same questions hadn't been asked of Joss and Johnny and Ben and Joffre. So it seemed very unfair. And, uh, and with the wider context, of it being mowing, some people who didn't understand and some people with agendas seem to want to use it and use it very quickly 
to criticize him in, 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 in very unfair ways, I thought. So the motivation for writing the piece I wrote was just to clarify and to defend him. Yeah, let's be honest, I was trying to defend him, but also to clarify that all those all format players were getting breaks. There was nothing different about this one. And why are we saying to him, well, why won't you stay? Where's your commitment? And this is, of course, the man who has been shunted up. He's batted everywhere from one to nine. He's been told he's not a very good bowler. But, you know, he, he has developed at a time when English cricket does not do very much to develop spin bowling. And he's filled a hole. Um, he was, I think, the last English player to be withdrawn from the IPL by the board. I don't know if people remember that. You know, Moen has been the one who's had to make way very, very often for other players. Ben Stokes wants to bat six. Josh Butler wants to bat seven. Where's Moen who moves? Uh, Johnny Bester could have a similar argument, actually. And so I felt that there was a need to put the record straight. But, you know, credit to Joe Root. He apologised very, very quickly to Moen. He said, look, I, I, I expressed myself clumsily. And which of us haven't done that? Uh, and so Moen's accepted that. And then uh, Chris Silverwood, who didn't do anything wrong, to be fair, uh, went on the record in a uh, press conference yesterday and said, look, it was our decision for Mo to go home. We're sorry that for the confusion. We're owning this. Terrific. I, I got nothing but praise for the way they've handled it. Uh, it, it, it or since, the, you know, the, the mess up. And which of us doesn't mess up occasionally? The issue with Moen is always that there will be those with agendas who want to criticise him. I think some criticism is fair enough. Look, I love Moen Ali, I'll be honest with you, and I like him uh, as a guy as well, and I love him as a cricketer. Uh, he can be infuriating. He hasn't made the most of his batting ability. When he nicks off, it frustrates me as much as anyone. When he bowls those full tosses, it frustrates me as much as anyone. There is legitimate criticism, of course there is. But also it felt as if the record needed to be put straight a bit and just say, it's always Moen who's being blamed. It's always Moen who's been asked to, to change, to move, to adapt. And I don't think there are very many batsmen who would have been dropped if they were the top run scorer in the world in the previous 12 months. And the fact is, Moen lost his place in the England team after one bad, really bad game uh, at the start of the Ashes. Personally, I thought it was right to take him out of the firing line. I thought he needed a holiday, really. But then he lost his central contract two months later, and I'm afraid the relationship has, you know, not recovered from that. Uh, I'll say again, it's unthinkable that anyone else, any of the cool guys in that team, would have lost their central contract in the same way. England are stuck with, stuck with just Butler through thick and thin. Absolutely fine. Good. So they probably should. They stuck with Ben Stokes through some real dark times. Spot on. I'm glad they have. Uh, they would stick with Joe Root through periods of, uh, you know, fallow periods by his standards. Moeen, top wicket taker in the world, and he doesn't just lose his place, he loses his central contract. I think that's pretty remarkable. I do think that when their careers are over, we will look at Johnny Bairstow and Moeen Ali as textbook examples of how not to manage players. It's not something... There are, there are two views that I've got on this. One is Moeen as a man, and, and as you just touched on, he he really is a lovely, lovely guy. Um, not someone that you would consider a troublemaker, uh, and I think <laughs> held in very high regard in the dressing room and you know amongst the other players. But this pattern of treatment goes back, you know, many, many years, um, and I think it, it it kind of puts fuel to the fire of those that have agendas and really in one or two cases who should know better. Um, do you think it's just carelessness um, or should people be looking at themselves a bit harder? What do you think? I think with Joe Root, it was just carelessness. It was just, I, I say again, I, I, those of us who do this for a living all the time uh, get our foot in our mouth all the time. It's just, you know, in my position, no one really cares. You get away with it. You're Joe Root, you're an England captain, you're on TV straight after a game, people notice. So yeah. uh, I think Joe Root has, and, and also he apologised very quickly. So I, I think he's earned the right to, um, to a bit of sympathy and a bit of respect there. And, you know, uh, I, yeah, I don't, I don't have any issues. And I, actually, I don't think he's portraying any confidences uh, here to say, I, I know Azim Rafiq quite well, who's obviously going through a very tricky time with the fallout of his period at Yorkshire, Azim 
tells me that Joe Root is the sort of fantastic guy who has always been incredibly supportive and uh, honourable and uh, yeah. So I've got no I've got no issues with concluding that that's just uh, a clumsy moment which we've. I, I don't I don't think necessarily Joe Root, but I'm more interested in you know the last five six years perhaps. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think English cricket is going through. Uh, a phase, English society maybe, but English cricket is going through a phase where we're all realising that actually some things that have gone on for a long time haven't been good enough. And I very much include myself in this. You know, some of the stuff that's happened in the last 12 months has been shocking and maybe it shouldn't have been. So, you know, and I'm talking about specifically the Black Lives Matter movement and the way that that has um, precipitated a period of reflection which I'm all for, uh, but we probably shouldn't have let things get to the state they were in. So, for example, I did that piece with uh, uh, John Holder and Ishmael Dawood uh, a, a while ago. And as I was writing it, I thought, how stupid am I for not having noticed that there weren't any non-white umpires? Yeah. <laughs> but what was I doing? I mean, about all these games, you know, and I've got this, let's be honest, a huge platform at Crick Info. Uh, you know, I'm as guilty as anyone there. I've dropped the ball. Um, so we're, we're as a game, we're reflecting on how things have been. And I think most people are accepting that unconscious bias training and all these sorts of things would be very useful. Uh, hands up. I, I want to go on that course. I absolutely do. And one of the things that uh, I'm seeing as the difference between sort of ignorant people and intelligent people is, in my view, is that the people who want to learn but the intelligent ones, the people who admit they don't know it all, maybe even. So I hope that's a roundabout way of coming back to the question, which is, has he been treated well in the last few years or has potentially unconscious bias been at play? Look, I can't give you a yes, no answer. I think there's been a lot of good people involved with Mo in at England level who have wished him well and have found him mercurial. He is, you know, <laughs> he, he, he will never be, you know, like in the same way that maybe David Gow was a bit, but he managed, didn't he? <laughs> um, so I think there are times when Moan would have been quite hard to manage. Uh, and we don't want to blame everything on something sinister. But I th also think there have been times when he's been treated oddly and it seemed like he was the easy one to upset. And whether that's about race or about his amenable personality, I don't know. I don't know these answers. But I do think it's one that we should reflect upon. And uh, I, I say again, I don't think many people are dropped and lose their central contract when they're the top wicket taker in the world in test cricket. So I, I and as a general rule, I think there are lots of times when he could have been uh, could have done with a lot more carrot and a little, little less stick. Um, and the problem with all these things, again, is that most people, I think, you know, are quite well-meaning and there'll be a lot of uh, legitimate criticism of any player's performance. Uh, you know, it does not mean you're racist if you say Moe no, no, no. has a, high, a goes for, you know, almost four and over in test cricket. It's completely legit. Of course it is. But you have to also understand that some people will use a legitimate criticism as a tool. And I heard Moe booed at Edgbaston and he wasn't being booed for his performance. I heard a lot of people in Edgbaston, can't remember what year that was, it was awful. I mean, it was really, really bad. Uh, and, you know, going back years before, actually, uh, yeah, I've, I've seen bad things at cricket crowds, but that was one of the worst I've seen recently. And it is a reminder that there's prejudice out there. So, again, I can't give you uh, an answer, but it is odd and the context needed repeating uh, or context needed setting out that um, Moen has often been made the scapegoat. And um, I thought he needed defending on this occasion, yeah. It's interesting what you say about um, crowd abuse because uh, I remember an interesting recollection from Ravi Bapara when he was playing for England uh, in the Champions Trophy final uh, a few years back and performing quite decently out in the middle. But he told a story about how he was getting booed by... Um, what he, he couldn't quite understand it, but ostensibly British Indian fans who were accusing him of being a Judas for wearing an England shirt, which is a ridiculous scenario from whatever angle you look at it. Um, 
And I think if you're looking at racism in sport, racism in society, um, it's not quite as obvious as maybe you might think. It does come from some very strange angles. It does look, uh, uh, yes, that, that's sort of the, a similar scenario that I was talking about. Yeah. Because um, I can't remember the game, if I'm honest, but it was, <laughs> it was British Indians who were basically booing and abusing, I don't know whether you even would call Moeen, a, 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 of, a, you know, his, his grandmother, as it happens, as a white woman from Birmingham. But, uh, you know, so I don't know. I mean, this is the whole thing. When you get into someone's ethnicity and heritage, the whole thing is absurd. Yeah, you know, don't, yeah. are we all African if you go back far enough? Yeah. So uh, one of the things I would say is that people are very nervous to talk about this. and We shouldn't be. We shouldn't be. It's, we've got to talk about it because that's how I think we learn. Um, so, uh, and, and that means that when people talk about it and when they might sometimes express themselves clumsily, we've got to be a bit understanding about that because we're all finding our way through this situation. So I think English cricket has realised it's got a problem. And I think it's only just realised it. It realised it with the figures about the lack of representation of black players. It realised it. You see, English cricket thinks it's doing really well with Asian players, and it's absolute rubbish. Yes. 30% of um, cricket played at recreational level in the UK is played by, oh, sorry, in England and Wales, is played by Asian players you get to the professional game, and it's 4%. Now, it's even worse when you're talking about cricketers of African Caribbean descent, well, particularly British ones, um, but it was, it's basically disappeared. I, I've used this stat in the cricketer recently, but I th I'm gonna, if you'll bear with me, I'll use it again, because it absolutely shocks me. I'm in Birmingham right now. Warwickshire, big club, uh, has trials each year. I can't remember how many people went to trials, but let's say 1,000, roughly, kids come to trials. How many of them were of African Caribbean heritage? One. No. One in Birmingham, which is the second biggest conurbation containing black people in the UK. Hansworth, yeah, yeah. Hansworth used to the West Indies team used to go to Hansworth Park at every tour, and and it was a it was a what it was a, a huge amount of people would turn up. What a mess we have made of things that we have somehow alienated that community from our game uh, amazing as someone who grew up watching loving the west indies somerset support here so uh, <laughs> viv and joel were, and, and helen mosley i still I still i'm 48 i still try and throw like helen mosley it's amazing <laughs> the impact these guys can have anyway um as someone it, it seemed unthinkable that west indies cricket in the uk could sink to the state it has it just it, there was such passion, and I, I mean, I was going to say, I don't know how we have alienated it or, or almost killed it. Playing devil's but advocate, do. though, do you not take that back to school level? Because kids would only go for a trial if they were performing at school and they were given opportunities at school. So let's just kind of take a step back away from English cricket. Uh, and I think if you're going to go down that, potential rabbit hole then you need to go well hang on a minute those kids aren't getting an opportunity to get into cricket yeah at school level yeah I mean, absolutely that's right so it's a, it's a you know you could very often come back to the same thing and say this isn't really about race it's about money uh, and, and and again you, you've got to be so careful with your your language here because i do not want to imply that there is not <laughs> a, a, an affluent middle class of black people because of course there is but also you have to acknowledge that there are some people or quite a lot of people in inner city schools who might well be non-white, who are not necessarily having the opportunity to watch Sky Sports and see any cricket, who are not having not cricket. To. Well, maybe, maybe. But I mean, if you are not from a cricket loving family, which I wasn't actually, uh, really, uh, I, I fell in love from watching um, the Sunday League because it used to be on the BBC every Sunday. John Player League, just, yeah. Yeah, John Player League, and it was just my gateway drug. You know, I, I, I was watching that, and uh, and from there, you know, I'm gone, aren't I? I've lost to it. As I say, it was my gateway drug, and, you know, um, I chased the dragon. Is that the expression? Not really my world. Uh, so a lot of this does come down to uh, finance, economics, and the fact that we have priced our game out of the market, out of the reach of so many people, and, you know, so many players 
uh, have uh, benefited from public school backgrounds. And that's a wonderful thing. I'm not saying it isn't, but, you know, we want our great game to be available to everybody. And it isn't. Uh, and the stats on that are absolutely overwhelming. And so this year, the last 12 months has been, a, 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 I mean, it can be very valuable. You know, I think, to be honest, we've sort of known this for a long time. We've known that if you sell the broadcast rights exclusively behind the paywall, that however useful that money is, and it's been terrific, and however good the coverage is, and Sky's coverage is crazy good. I mean, honestly, you go around the rest of the world. I mean, have you been watching some of the stuff we've been seeing in the recent days? Anyway, um, it, it's, it's really good. But, you know, all that money, publicity is the oxygen of the sport, you know? And uh, even billionaires die without oxygen. And what English cricket was looking like uh, a couple of years ago as a very fat billionaire without oxygen. Now, we, we've had a reset. We have. We've had a reset. There's been so much happened. and We could either look at it as terrible. You know, the pandemic's obviously awful. And, and, and some of the stuff that we've seen come out, starting with Michael Carberry, perhaps, has, has probably been uh, very shocking and looks very awful. But we can make good come of it. And this is the important thing. We have to acknowledge the faults and be open to change. Uh, and, you know, I think Moen's had a big role in that. But I, I worry a bit that guys like Moen and Joffre, they're used as the poster boys for inclusivity. But actually, they're so extreme. that the, they, are, they are the turtle that comes back to the beach. They're one in a thousand. So I don't want them to be used really as a sign that, you know, this is all right. You, you can make it if, if you like these guys. Because, well, Joffre didn't, you know, to some extent didn't come through the English system at all. Mm. Uh, you know, he was not fully formed, but he was obviously a fantastic player before he turned up in England. And Moen's family, I mean, Moen's dad went without food to, to enable to get him to trials at time. What they've gone through is not normal. Kabir Ali, Moen's cousin, had a cricket ball put in his cot the day he was born. You know, those, those <laughs> uh, Moen and Kabir's dads are twin brothers. They love cricket. They, they, they love it. They make my interest in cricket seem shallow and superficial, I tell you. Uh, and they wanted their boys to, uh, to thrive in cricket. And they did everything. It's not normal. It's not it's not really something that could be replicated by most families. Uh, so I, I'm always a bit uneasy about those fellas being used as sort of examples that everything's okay. Uh, I think things are a hell of a long way from okay, but at least I think the penny has dropped. And uh, as I say, hopefully, I know it's a terrible cliche, but we, you know, we can build back better. And I know that when you put this out, by the way, I'm going to get, I mean, it doesn't matter, but I, I will get abuse for being, I don't know, the, the normal stuff. I mean, look at my Twitter feed in the last few days. It's, um, it's, it's wearing, but, you know, people will say I'm woke or whatever. Uh, well, you, you know, if only. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, I guess, I mean, yeah, as an observation, generally, whenever I hear someone described as woke, I've not, I've not really thought this through, but I, I think whenever I hear someone described as woke, I think they're probably a well-meaning person. And I, and I probably think I'm a smidgen of, you know, I probably like them. I, I'm almost certain that the person who used the expression is an utter cock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Before we let you go, um, let's, let's get back to um, possibly more positive things. Um, what are your thoughts ahead of Ahmedabad? Well, I, I'm not being there. I, I, I kind of, uh, I think my thoughts are pretty worthless, to be honest. So, <laughs> out of, Well, they are really, because I don't know what the pitch looks like. I don't know uh, what the pink SG ball will behave like. And I don't know how people are bowling in training. I think there might be a temptation. Chris Silverwood said yesterday that the pink ball seemed more durable and it seemed to swing both more and for longer. Now, that's interesting. So I can see a temptation to play the extra seamer, maybe Chris Wokes, and not recall Don Bess. Um, from a huge distance, as I say, with all the caveats not really having a valid opinion, uh, I would be very nervous about that. I mean, I always love to see Chris Wokes play, but I was at the 2012 underbad test, 
which I think England went into with one spinner. Actually, they may have gone in with one spinner and Sam it, to be fair, as the second spinner. So it's so kind of an all-rounder. Maybe a Joe Root sort of spinner up to a point. That's probably a bit harsh. And they got, they got thrashed. So I would be very reluctant to ever go into a test in India without two frontline spinners. And Joe Root is a useful bowler, but he is a bit of a change bowler. And he, you, you wouldn't want him bowling long spells. You don't want him bowling 30 overs in innings. He's got, he's got a role, but it's very specific. So that worries me a bit. Um, but I, 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 you would think that the pink ball is a bit of a leveller. And if England are going to win this series, which, which I would have thought seemed impossible a month ago, really, I mean, then they've got a chance. They're 1-1 and the pink ball gives them a chance. But I don't know about things like the toss. You would always think, in India, you bat first. You, you, you would think always, maybe on a fresh surface with a pink ball. I don't know. Maybe this is a leveller. You would think it is, wouldn't you? So, um, as I say, I think most English supporters, if they're honest, would be pretty comfortable with 1-1 at this stage, if you'd been asked a month ago. I think yeah. it's great timing, isn't it? Because, as you, as you rightly say, there's been a lot of um, suggestions that in this series and, and on home soil, you win the toss, you win the match. Or rather, you win the toss, you don't lose the match. So, I think this is great yeah. timing in that it, Although, it opens up Sorry, sorry. To I think England won. I think England won the toss nearly all the time in the previous tour, 2016. I mean, and, and they lost, of course, very heavily. The um, I think they lost four 0 out of five, didn't they? So the difference this time, I see improvement. You know, in in the first test uh, in Chennai, they also won the toss in 2016. I think they scored four seventy, and there was this acknowledgement this time that four seventy wasn't enough. And that's quite a change. That's quite a change in mindset in, in English thinking. So uh, I thought that was terrific. And, and I wouldn't be too hard on them for this loss. Um, the, the conditions were extreme, which is, which is fine. I don't have an issue with that. But they were quite extreme. And um, they probably made England look a bit less good than they are. I don't think they've suddenly, you know, they, they've won all these games. Six games in a row in Asia. Incredible. Um, they... they they deserve uh, some patience, I think. Uh, but it will be interesting. I, 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 the other thing I'd say is if they win this series, it would be the greatest achievement that I would have seen from an England test team, I think. Because I know they won in 2012, which was a miracle. But they did have, you know, KP at his best. They had Swan and Panasar at their best and Cook. And, you know, they did have a very strong side. And they won in Australia in 10-11. In fact, they didn't just win. They, they <laughs> completed a series of results, which the world has never seen before. They beat them by an Indian together and again. That was incredible. But it was an extremely strong England team. This one, this, this is a team in transition. This is a team with lots of people being rested. And it is up against a mighty opponent. So I honestly think if England win this series, they'll deserve all the praise in the world. It's desperately tough. Uh, it would be as big an achievement as I've seen from England test side. I honestly think that. Well, we'll find out on Wednesday. Um, George, thank you so much for your time. Fascinating well, talking. Thank, thank you. I'm sorry. I feel I've, I've rambled and uh, no, you haven't. barely <laughs> coherent. But these are difficult, difficult conversations. But I do think it's important we keep having them because um, it's only when we stop talking about things that we stop sort of challenging ourselves. Does that make sense? Uh, I, I think it's really, really important that the, uh, the conversation keeps happening. George Sabell from ESPN Creek Info and The Cricketer, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and uh, we look forward to the next test, which starts on Wednesday. Cheers, guys. 